You're listening to That Gets My Goat on the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Welcome, everyone, to the Dune Steve That Gets My Goat on the Go. That is a mouthful. You can hear the car engine in the background and the road rushing past. I hope that's not too annoying to people. The two of us are coming back from Las Vegas. We've still got a few more hours in our drive. And we thought, well, we'll podcast again. Yeah, we thought we'd uh, talk a little bit about the fun that we had and what we did while we were there. And let you know what you can look forward to from this whole experience. It seemed like this time around was two, three, four times more productive That's than the last time around, right? I was just about to say, this year was way more productive than... I was going to use that same word, productive, and then when you said two, three times, I was like, oh, what is he talking about? <laughs> but was... you're right. We accomplished so much more this year. We had so much more fun, and yet we... We were in so many more panels and so much busier. But boy, yeah, I felt like this was a way better experience on every level than last year. I guess we can talk about that. We did record a Dunstief episode last night, like we did last year with Office Visit, where we summed up, where Big talked a lot about some of the things that we had done and seen. So maybe we'll try to avoid repeating those same stories on this, whereas last year... You don't want to tell the story about the guy with the sign? and the... No, uh, well, okay. I, we'll, I, I we'll... do want to tell that story. But... <laughs> we'll save it. You have that to look forward to. A story about a guy with a sign, everybody. And yeah, maybe someone other than me will be in charge of producing that episode. And so it will come out less than a year from now. <laughs> Anyhow, the New Media Expo is... A convention in Las Vegas. It's held in the Rio Hotel and Casino for new forms of communication and entertainment and information swapping. So, podcasts and video blogs and regular blogs and Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and uh, sharing yourself, marketing yourself and your work in new ways rather than just the old publishing or the old broadcasting. You know, people that do Vine videos, people that do prank videos, people that do really high-end amateur porn videos. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, you know what? That was a panel I went to on my own. It, oh, it yeah, that was the videos. other conference. That was the bridal porn show you saw oh. just down the way. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Let's cut out the part where I talk about how much of a turn-on a bridal... Uh, a bridal gown the, is? the bridal outfit and the yeah the bridal magazines are to me yes we should cut that out anyhow we got invited last year through Abigail Hilton I believe and they were trying to to branch out a little bit from the it's all about technology and it's all about what you can make from doing it it's all about how to improve your market share and brand awareness and and just all this commerce they decided, well, maybe we should focus a little bit more on content. Yeah, a little and so more on art. There were a couple of panels last year about that. We did one. Who, who did the other one, Marshall? The other one was Marshall, uh, Renee, and Brian were in the other one. This year, we were in so many panels. The first day, I, you know, I sat on... Or participated in three panels. Yeah, you and I both. Were which in was three, three times what we did last year, just in one day. And this year, all of the hard work was done, not all, but 90% of the hard work was done by Renee Chambliss because she organized it. She asked people to speak. She prepared the slides. She prepared the information ahead of time, you know, to register. And so our names would show up on the, the schedule and all that stuff. Just, to, you know, if there was a problem, I think it was up Yo, to Renee. she'll fix, solve it? Yeah. She t turned on the, well, the DJ, what is it? Turn Check on. out the hook while my DJ revolves it. Yeah, ice, ice, baby. <laughs> she uh, did a lot of work, but I could see that it was taxing. Yeah. You know, it was, was emotionally born, yeah. draining. And anytime anything went wrong, it was Renee that was expected to either take responsibility for it or fix it in some way. 
And I don't imagine she'll want to do that next year. But I certainly wouldn't want it to be me. <laughs> I was glad on the panel that you did, that you did that panel. Because I just, uh, I just had too much on my plate, or had too much on my plate in the days leading up to it, to possibly do anything that wasn't half-assed. But even so, it, it was really neat that they gave us so much more room to play this year. They had a whole room, and on the night before the conference, they said, this is your room. All of your panels are going to be in here. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. And they already had our names in front of the room. And because of that, the downside was we didn't get to go to any of the other panels, any of the stuff about, you know, how to turn your Pinterest page into a money-making spigot. But the upside was we didn't have to go to any of those other panels about, like, how to turn your Pinterest page into a money-making spigot. Last year, I just, I was so alienated by that, by that aspect of it. How to turn a dedicated fan base into a rabid, money-generating behemoth. And, you know, they all were, they all had some kind of corporate speak in the names of these panels or in the... And maybe I shouldn't badmouth it. I remember some of the people saying, you know, try not to be too harsh on this because we are their guests. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was... Uh, we did a lot more recording and stuff this year as opposed... Which is kind of strange because we... Yeah, we had less time to do it in. You know, last year we had one day worth of panels and it was like the last day and several of us were there for, you know, the whole weekend. So... We just hung out and, you know, did whatever the hell we wanted to all weekend long until that last day when we finally did our panels. And yet I still feel like we did way more of whatever the hell we wanted to this year. Yeah, it did that, seem like it. I, I don't know. It was just a really, really good experience and I'm very glad I went. For example, last year Abby wanted to go on the roller coaster and was never able to do so. Why? I don't know. You would think it would be easy enough with all the time that we were there. This year, she retained that as her goal to go on the roller coaster. And we went on the roller coaster like the second night or the first night. Second. And still had plenty of time to do a lot of other stuff as well. So. Well, hey, I want to, I, before we get too far into this, I really appreciate Renee for doing all that work and for inviting us to be here and for Abby for inviting us to be here last year. But... If you're listening to, to this, thank you. We could not have gone to the New Media Expo if people hadn't donated to the podcast and paid for gas. <laughs> True enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody else, I, I think with one exception, everybody else flew. But we drove, and we're driving right now, and we're only able to do that because we knew that we wouldn't have to blow a week's salary on gas. Right. It's even worse if we had if we would have had to get two plane tickets. Um, I hear you. And which I, is one of the reasons why we are yet to make it out to one of those uh, other cons that people go to as podcasters, like Balticon or Dragon Con. It's just it's uh, it's yeah, it's expensive and hard to justify. One of the things that they say again and again at these at the New Media Expo is. You know, there are people that will give you money if you will tell them how just to give you that money. Or there are people that will give you of their time. Or there are people that will love your show if they only find out about it. And these are things that we have learned on a limited scale in doing the Steve in the years that we've done it. Um, and so, just again, if you have donated to the show, I don't know that we can say it enough how much we appreciate that people have done that. They've donated money. But if you've donated your time to the show, to producing or doing episode art or giving us a voice or reading the slush pile or whatever it is, spreading the word simply about, hey, there's this show that I really like. Thank you very much for doing that. And I should, we should, ask you guys to do that more. You're a resource that can make our show better. And because for some reason I was raised that you don't want to ask people for help. You want to be self-sufficient. It's really hard for me to say, hey, folks, we could always use help or all we, we still need 
this, or if you want to donate to the show, we will we'll use your money to help the show continue. And maybe, again, you know, we did a, a New Year's resolutions episode during this drive. Maybe I should have made that as one of my resolutions to try to ask people to contribute in whatever way they can just because some other podcast might do it and take the volunteer, you know, somebody who would love to cut their teeth producing a 2,000 word triple word score story but because we didn't mention it enough or say that, hey, we're still accepting help if you want to do that they didn't they didn't do it the, you know the next parsec award losing Doonstief episode <laughs> has yet to be made guys there you go so yeah I'm definitely going to echo that thanks a lot for all the help and donations that we have received and if you are one of those people that hasn't donated or helped yet or even if you are one of those people that has, you know, you're welcome to do it again. If you'd like to, we're still open to it. So, what else happened at New Media Expo? What did we learn? What did we well, do that was fun? The truth is that I didn't dedicate nearly any time at all to going to these panels and trying to learn other things. I was there in my own panels and supporting the panels of our friends all three days. And uh, I still managed to learn things. For example, Renee produced, organized, if you will, uh, a panel all about the uh, ACX pro, uh, audiobook creation exchange. The audiobook creation exchange, and she had like one of the founders or one of the directors of that project come and talk, and they were just talking about how that has been successful for them and how many more audiobooks there are out there that are in need of narrators or how many narrators there are that would love to read your book and, and it just it made me want to get up off my butt I have done one story ever of my own through that process and all the rest of the time I have been the narrator and why not put a story or two of mine on there and say if somebody would like to narrate this you know then I would have an audio version of this story that, that would be great and I've written a couple of things that are very big that are not no, novel length but they're definitely novella length and something that they stressed was people are more hesitant to spend their credits on something that's small and so I thought well, why not put up something bigger if it's more apt to sell Anyway, that, that was interesting. Uh, you and I went somewhere, and we had a, a caricature artist do our faces. <laughs> right. And I turned out looking like the, the most devious person at the entire conference, despite the fact that there was all these people that were just shysters and snake oil salesmen. My particular uh, caricature was like me, like squinting and like looking sideways and this crafty look on his face on my face well yeah if you go to the main page that is up now uh, my caricature and Big's caricature just for fun we're going to put that up there uh, that was something else that Scott Sigler was talking about was that you are the brand not your particular project that you're working on that's something that he learned while being a self-published writer who, uh, of, who did audio versions of his own work for free is the product that he wanted to promote wasn't Infected, the novel that he wrote. The product that he needed to promote was Scott Sigler is an author that you like, that you like his voice, that you like the stuff that he writes. That way, when that book ended and it was time for the next book, he didn't have to start over from scratch. And I thought about that too. And yeah, I mean, our logo is always the D for the Dune Steve and, but is the Dune Steve our product or is Big and Rish our product and I, I don't know that there's a, a definitive answer on that I don't know if there's a difference I think the Dune Steve and Big and Rish are the same ish <laughs> well I guess because we're the consistent part of every episode 
Sometimes it's going to be a Mike Resnick story or it's going to be a J.M. Perkins story. And other times it will be a bigger Rish story, but, but no matter it's always what, going to be talking. us. And so maybe we should put our faces out there more on the website and have more of a... Oh, I don't even know if we have a page, if I have a page just about Rish Outfield on dudesteve.com where you can click and you can go to my blog and you can find out about me and you can see the stuff that I've written that's out there. You can buy my stories. You can find out what I'm podcasting, you know, other projects that I have. I don't think there is something like that and I, there probably should be. There probably should be, yeah. There's there's one for me, but not for you. That's weird. Oh, you best. <laughs> something that Abby Hilton encouraged me to do is every time I put a story out there to put a little note at the end that says, if you like this, why not try Office Visitor or why not try A Slight Delay, you know, and then have a link to those two stories that somebody can check out if they liked what they read. And it never even occurred to me to do that because I I don't think that way. I, I, I am not right-brained or whatever side of the brain it takes to think in that way and, and organize and, and be like, yeah, if somebody liked a story of mine, it's only natural they would want to know what else I wrote. Right. It's like and when so, you open up a book that you uh, are going to read and at the start it's a, it has lists of all the other books that that particular author has written. That sort of stuff is fun, too. I remember being a kid and opening it up after I liked a book saying, okay, let, I'm going to read this one next, or I'm going to try and track this one down. Yeah. So it goes uh, hand in hand with my New Year's goal of getting more, not just more stuff out there, but letting people know that my stuff is out there. That was something that I, a goal that I made after going to the New Media Expo and hearing them talk about that. He Another thing Sigler talked about was that he had a, Another episode of his podcast ever come out every Sunday. Was it Sunday? Yeah, it was every Sunday. Every Sunday Bloody for like five Sunday. years or since 2005 or some crazy number like that. Every Sunday he does it. For he has the advantage of podcasting his novels. So you could put out a part of a chapter or an entire chapter. And there's many, many, many more of those too. But he also podcasts interviews and podcasts little things when he's on the road just to check in so that there's constantly a connection between him and his fan base and I love that I, I what a great idea and that's something we as the Dune Steve could have done much much better of getting on there and saying hey there's not going to be an episode until February and this is why and saying that's good enough for an episode just so people know yeah do you think it would have been wiser for us to have put the main show and that gets my goat and all of them together as one feed and never have split them up? I won't answer that question, but if our product is us rather than the Dune Steve or that gets my goat, then yes, that would have been the right way to go. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. If everything that we do is of the same value as the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine, then yes, it all should be one stream or one website or whatever the one deal is feed. but I don't know that that's the case I don't know that what we're recording right now is of the same value as an episode of the Dune Steve where it's somebody's story and we put sound effects and we put music and there's multiple voices in it I've always felt like that is our prize possession that is our jewel in the crown that is our flagship uh -huh. of our particular fleet and everything else ha is fun and is good and all that. But when somebody asks, what do you do? The Dune Steve is what we point to. Right. What do you think? Well, basically, this is what I think. We probably should put it all together in one and then just make it uh, clear when somebody opens it up and they say, oh, there's a new episode. It says, that gets my goat you know, right there at the top so they know exactly what it is. And so after hearing one that gets my goat, they know, oh, yeah, I'm not a fan of that my gets my goat, just the main show. So whenever that gets my goat comes up, they can just, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll delete that one and just stick with only the main show. But those who really like us 
you know, I think I've, I've found that a lot of people, they say that they love the show, but they haven't still even tried That Gets My Goat. And they're like, yeah, when are you guys going to put out a new episode? And I'm just like, well, we put out five That Gets My Goat since the last episode of the show. So if you really miss us, you can go listen to that. And they're like, oh, yeah, thought about That Gets My Goat, but I still haven't tried it out. And I think it might have been wise. And, you know, the thing is, it's not something that we can't fix in the future and so there may come a day when that happens when the Dune Steve brand merges all onto one feed and yeah if you want to sift through all that stuff volunteer to do it (laughs) because it'll take big until about 2018 to sift through it all that's true but yeah I think it would be cool to even I know that uh, for example Cory Doctorow does this anytime anybody does anything that's one of his uh, stories or whatever. He puts that onto his feed, you know? He's like, you, if you're doing my story, A, has to be Creative Commons. And when it's Creative Commons, then he can just throw it on. So he just links to it. And so when we did his story, it just came right up on the Cory Doctorow feed. Cool. And yes, Scott Sigler, we did a reading of Scott Sigler's story, Chuckles Mulrooney, Attorney for the Damned. It was brilliant. It was so good. And apparently that's going to be one of his Sunday episodes someday of his own podcast. And so that'll be really, really cool. But I think we would be doing ourselves a huge disservice if we didn't put that on out ourselves. Right. Yeah, I think um, when he puts it out, we will just add it right in there so that you can uh, you can get it as well. Um as with anything Creative Commons, you can just do that. That's because it's share and share alike. Um, so that'll be cool. One of the things that that sort of flies in the face of what I just said about the black ship and Jewel and the Crown and all that stuff is uh, we met up with a couple of our fans during this new Media Expo thing. And uh, one of them was Tom Tancredi. And he was the guy who had really said nice things about our 13 nights of Halloween marathon in 2012 um, and, and just how much he enjoyed that and look uh, I guess it it cheered him up when he was having hard times uh, and then we met uh, we met Rachel Doherty who is a listener I could have stared at her for the rest of my life dude but what was coming out of her mouth was awesome because I got the impression that gets my goat is what she looks forward to. And she just, she says that, you know, I go to work and I listen to that gets my goat and you guys are just so much fun. And she had so many nice things to say that I was just like, wow, we should do more. We should put this stuff out way more. We should make more of an effort to, to get together and always record these things because I honestly felt like that gets my goat was the stepchild. You know what I mean? That that was maybe not the redheaded stepchild, but definitely the bastard stepchild. The toe-headed stepchild. Uh, the strawberry blonde. Okay. Of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine, because it, it's not nearly the work that the Dune Steve is. That gets my goat. What we're doing right now is so easy that it just feels like hanging out. Right. And if something funny comes out of my mouth, great. But if it doesn't, no pressure. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Whereas for the Dune Steve or whatever, sometimes I feel guilty if I don't write a sketch or I produce something and it could have had way more soundscape going underneath it or way more, more music, but I didn't do it because it's just too much work. And with, yeah, with That Gets My Goat, we could release this unedited and I think people would still like it because they're connecting with us and they're listening to how things went and... It's just, uh, it's something that, was it Scott Sigler or was it David Lawrence, the 17th said that people will make a connection to your voice and, and you'll, that I know that guy, I hang out with that guy. That guy's a buddy of mine. They start to make that connection subconsciously. Not that this is a stranger I've never met, but this is a friend. And that's what I wanted to do from the beginning with the Dune Steve audio fiction magazine. And, uh, to find out that there are people out there that feel that way just it rocks my world yeah it's it's really cool and it's something that we don't get to do very often you know go somewhere and meet people that just listen to the show Uh, even the last media new media expo you know we went 
and we got to meet people that worked on the show with us, but just meeting people that just liked the show and just listened to the show, um, yeah, this was the first time that it worked out. I think Rachel was going to try and hang out with us at the uh, karaoke last year. I remember her trying to give us a hand at finding a place to do the karaoke at. I think she may have suggested Ellis Island at one point, too. Well, see, I wish that we'd gotten together last year. We might be engaged by now. <laughs> I do believe um, she's married yeah, to someone Yeah, she else. mentioned it several times. Tom. But, uh, yeah, she could tell how much you were just staring. And she's like, okay, no, seriously, Rish, you're scaring me. Um, but, yes, yeah, so that's something that you just mentioned. We did get to hang out with a bunch of fellow podcasters and people who have contributed to the show. And there were a couple of people who have never contributed before. We just met... Uh, that got to do voices and help us uh, out with our stories for forthcoming episodes. And that's another thing that we wanted to talk about in this episode is what you can look forward to if you look forward to the, to us. <laughs> because we got accomplished so much, we recorded so much that should help pad out this year and make it better, at least in the amount of content that we put out, than last year. Yeah, we... Um... Gosh, I, I wonder if we could even remember everything that we did. I know the first day that we recorded, we recorded two new barbecue sketches that went with, what was it called, Wedded Bliss, I believe was the name of the um, The first. one we recorded last year. Yeah. yeah, we recorded that one last year. It was me and Rish and Brian, and we were bragging about how amazing our wedding, our, our marriage was. And then, you know, at one point we changed our tune and started instead bragging about how awful it was uh if you can call that bragging um and yeah folks i think really enjoyed it and i think it was originally intended to just be a little skit and then it wound up being just the entire episode so this time around you had written two more since then and we brought them both with us and we recorded those the first night as I... well as something for marshall's podcast yeah as well as something for Brian's panel the next day. Was there anything else that we recorded that first day, or was that it? Well, we recorded that day another Catastrophe Baker story. Right, yeah, that morning... That's part of our, our panel. That morning our panel was reading a Catastrophe Baker story as a live reading. And sadly, I figured out that first day how I could plug my Zoom straight into their mixer and get their signal and record it uh, on my own device so that I don't have to wait. Last year I waited until they finally sent out this thing they have called the virtual ticket to where you can go and you can find any a recording of any of the panels that happened that maybe you missed or you wanted to hear again or whatever and you could download the audio for that. And I, that's how I managed to get our panels from last year onto the feed. Um, and so this year I'm hoping to do that again with the Catastrophe Baker one because I had not started rolling at that point. I didn't realize that I could do that just yet. Um, so we did that, and hopefully we can get a recording of that and perhaps put it on that gets my goat, I guess. And I know that Renee is planning to do a full version of that Catastrophe Baker story as well, which should be fun. You can... I guess listen to both versions and see which you like better and, and stuff like that. There'll be the live version, which will have probably some fairly low quality sound to it, unfortunately, because it's in a big room with a lot of echoes. And then there will be, you know, the, the version that's recorded in a, a, a much better environment. And, uh, that will be interesting. So that was what we recorded the first day. And also I recorded all through all of our panels. And uh, I'll most likely throw those up on the feed for people to listen to as well. And then uh, second day we recorded more stuff. We went back to the hotel room and recorded a, a few more things. There's a story that we bought from Matthew Sanborn Smith that has been basically in d development hell. It was like one of those uh, Hollywood scripts that gets greenlit or something, but then it gets stuck 
going in circles and, and just never comes out. Kind of like Frozen, which was the Snow Queen, which Disney had been trying to adapt into a film since all the way back when, like, Snow White came out, right? I, I you know, I don't know. I, I know it was in the 50s they okay. developed that one. But I, I think what you're thinking of is Little Mermaid, which was way, way back there. Oh, okay. Well, both of them. I mean, if Snow Queen, they started with in the 50s, and it came out 20 years after Did. Little Mermaid. Oh, 20 years after Little Mermaid. Right. That means that it's been going for, what, um, 65 years that they've been going on and off on that. That's almost the level of this poor Matthew Sanborn Smith story. Uh, which is called The Empire State Building Strikes Back. And we finally got it all recorded uh, after having all sorts of mishaps with it before. And it's been, I would say, more than two years since we got the story from Matthew. And, and yeah, I mean, we've talked about lost episodes in the past where things have happened and it just never was able to get to us. This is the worst ever of those lost episodes. And now, I believe we will finally be able to get that put together and get that out. What else did we record that second night? I don't know. That was roller coaster night. No, that was karaoke night. Ah. I the, think that the bells, bells, bells. That was the first night. That was roller coaster night. Okay. That may have been it that second night. The third night I busted out a J.M. Perkins story from our triple word score that I printed out and brought with us, and we recorded that uh, story. So that one uh, is now, you know, the wheels are rolling on that one, and it uh, should be on its way to us somewhat shortly. That one is called Field Exercises, or Field Exercise. Uh, I can't remember for sure. And then I also managed to get them... I, I, I <laughs> had been hoping to do it and this wound up being the last thing we recorded which was a story of my own that I printed out the story is called Through the Din of Silence which is a bad title we never really talked about it we didn't uh, I, I don't think it's a bad title at all I mean unless you shoehorned that in and unless it was originally the title and you forced it into the story no no I didn't I had no title for it originally and I couldn't think of what to call it and I eventually just kind of read through the story and picked out a little tidbit and put it in there as the title of the story and said, yeah, this sounds good and it kind of works and so I used that as the title. Um, but I don't really like titles like that usually. I like one that, that doesn't seem so obscure, that sums it up a little better. You know, a title like Baby Talk or Say Uncle. Really any one of those. I mean, when you did that story, which is also forthcoming, by Rish Outfield. He's got a story called Say Uncle that's upcoming. And he did this, he wrote this story, and then he came up with as many titles as he could, it seemed. And Generation all of Gap. them, Generation Gap, Baby Talk, Say Uncle, all of them were better than Through the Tin of Silence for uh, his story. And I wish I could have come up with something like that for my story, but I, I, I'm one of those people that is not good with titles. And usually either I have a title, from the get-go or I never get one and uh, this was one of those cases where I didn't ever get one but anyways we recorded that story and it is forthcoming some people may remember it because one time like two or three years ago I published the story on my blog and asked for people's comments on it and then I unpublished that story back off of my blog so you can't go back through my blog to find it but uh, those who did read it at that time uh, may remember the story, and, and that is forthcoming. That's our episode from the New Media Expo for this year, because right afterwards, I had everybody that had participated in the reading of the story uh, join us and participate in the post-story uh, comments, the conversation after the story. And uh, so, yeah, it was... Uh, a lot of fun. We recorded so many things, including every panel that we were on, to the point where I have a 32 gigabyte card on my Zoom to record onto, which gives me like well over 20 hours, maybe more than that, of 
wave, you know, uncompressed quality audio that I can record onto it. And I'm almost full. <laughs> it's really close. We're less than we're less than three hours probably right now left over because of how much I've recorded. Of course, I've got a bunch of garbage on there that I should have gotten rid of a long time ago and cleaned off, but I just haven't, and I'm going to have to wade through it all when I get back. Yeah, I managed to record an episode of my Star Wars podcast, oh, right. Delusions that, of Grandeur is We the did name that yesterday, too. That's right. And that's something I don't think I've ever mentioned on the show. That should be one of my goals again for the new year. Uh, is to mention that Marshall Latham and I have a Star Wars related podcast that we, we're trying to do monthly and uh, we sat down with Renee Chambliss because she's got a very different point of view when it comes to the, uh, the prequels of the Star and the Star Wars trilogy and geez I honestly I've never known a girl who was that into Star Wars <laughs> She, you know, she knew all sorts of stuff, and she had these memories of when Star Wars first came out. Yeah, she really knew It was just her stuff. awesome to listen to her talk about it, and uh, we could have done three episodes. Uh, we had that much potential content. Once the cameras stopped rolling, we continued talking about it, and there was a bunch of other things that, that yeah, we were was, chattering about. It was unfortunate, because I think Marshall's Zoom ran out of memory right in the, somewhere near the end of that. And so you guys had to kind of cut it short because you probably could have gone on for much longer. Of course, Renee also had somewhere to be, so you couldn't have gone on forever. But you could have gone on forever. It seemed like you guys were just getting started, and then all of a sudden you're like, well, we're out of time. I'm sorry. But yeah, that's uh, an interesting thing and, and definitely worth looking forward to. Uh, well, no, I'm, because Marshall is editing this particular episode, I did the last episode. And because he's editing this one, it's long since been published by the time you're hearing this. <laughs> Seriously, he's... Yeah, but people don't probably don't even know about it. It's only oh. the third episode of the show at all. Okay. So, yeah, it's definitely something that, uh, that should be mentioned. Yeah, it's a brand new podcast that they've just started. And... Uh, seems like we're getting to the point where maybe we should make, you know, a lot of people were talking about people that have podcast networks, which I have no idea really what that means, but it seems like we've got enough podcasts these days. Maybe we need to get a podcast network going on. Yeah, I think we could, if Marshall were amenable, we could put his three podcasts under the same umbrella as our podcasts. I mean, you and I, between us, have five podcasts that I, I can think of, and so that's uh, that's something to think about. But I don't know. It just a lot of the new media expo is is how do you make money? How can you do a more professional fill in the blank? How can you turn something that's amateur into professional and all that stuff? But. Uh, a lot of it, yeah, is also, hey, you need to do this better. You need to work harder on this. Or you need to work smarter. Do the exact same amount of work that you're doing now, but get more results. And that's something that even if you aren't a money-grubbing fat cat, you can appreciate. So, there's that. Definitely. Oh, and yeah, and that's one thing. is I have a solo podcast that I do, and... I guess there's not. It's not even on its own feed. I've never bothered to put upload the new episodes to its feed, or you know, even check to see if the the episodes link to the right show. I know that somebody said that I had like episode two and episode three were the exact same episode, <laughs> which would be uh, an issue. And so those are things that I need to improve on, need to work on. Because there are people that would enjoy listening to those. And I've worked hard on them. Why not let people listen to them? Yeah, definitely. And they are good shows. And, yeah, it's funny. Fake Sean Connery has a much larger part in uh, the making of those other shows than he does in the regular Doom Steve. I'm sure Fake Sean Connery shows up now and then in a regular episode. But he's not a constant member of the team like announcer man or uh, 080T have been 
Hey, that's something you mentioned earlier about 08 OT and your plans to use him. Is that one of your New Year's resolutions, is to resurrect 08 OT? I would like to get him back involved in the show. I think he feels sad that he's been so left out for all this time, and I feel sad that, uh, you know, we haven't used him to his potential. But the real problem is that I think I like 08 OT way, way, way more than you do, and so you're happy to just let him disappear and die because he's just a pain in your ass. Most of the stuff that's good on our show comes from things that you are enthusiastic about. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll have to see if that can happen, but well, yeah. Well, when I was the voice of 08 OT, he was on the show every week. But once I no longer controlled the robot, uh, it just, yeah, I, I, I had no motivation to you know, give you a list of things that 08 OT is supposed to say in this episode. Right. Um, well, maybe we just need to go back to that. I think that might be a, a, a good way to solve it. We'll let you do a robot voice that is 08 OT from here on out. Okay, well, we, we, that's one of our goals, I guess, for 2014 is bring back the robot. Resurrect 08 OT. You know, we could... There's one of those things that I've always wanted to do from all the way back. This is like from three or four years ago when I first had the idea that it would be... Oh, and I even had announcer man record this, the bits for it. It was the and then Yeah, I, mentioned, I wanted to mention that to you on the drive down because I couldn't for the life of me remember if we had actually done that sketch or not. We never did it, but I had announcer man record it and it was... You know, that thing from Dude, Where's My Car, where they go to get the Chinese food or the... Uh, it wasn't Chinese. Yeah, I think it was Chinese. It was Vietnamese yeah. or something. Oh, I don't remember what it was. But anyways, they went to get the takeout at the at the, the restaurant, and the lady over the thing would always just say, and then... And they felt compelled to buy something else because she said, and then. And... Uh, I thought it would be really funny to use that little bit as announcer man tries to introduce everyone who's on the show that day, and he starts, he, he feels compelled to use every special guest we've ever had, and then we would have this show now where we were stuck with all of these special guests in the studio. That's cool. And I, I, I would still like to use that one someday, because we have it recorded, it would just take a lot of effort. Well, and we mostly have... on your part, because most of those spe special guests are uh, are your thing. And so you would have to, uh, you know, keep them chiming in throughout the entirety of the show. Well, hey, that reminds me of another thing that we did uh, that, we, that they should be out by this point. In fact, I'm going to hold you to it. By the time this episode comes out you'll be able to tell people where to find this but we did you know you're really really fond of Dr. Seuss's all the places you'll go and so I thought it would be fun to have all of the fake celebrities that come on the show or the different voices that I do do all the places you'll go as a Christmas gift to our listeners oh was it a Christmas gift see I was pretty and sure it was a don't do gift to those who donate I was only going to send it to those who donated. But how would you do a YouTube the YouTube thing video be, for only the people that donate? would be later? It would be you know the people who get it get to listen to it, okay. and we could even put the link. Hey, here's there's a YouTube video where you can go and see. Okay. If you but I'm make I'm a game putting out you of it. on the spot right now. Tell people where on YouTube they can find that. How to search for that. And that by the time this episode airs, we're recording this the first week of January. By the time this episode airs in February or whatever it is, people can go onto YouTube and type in what and find that. If they look up Big Anklevich, I think they could find it. I have a Big Anklevich YouTube account, and uh, I don't know what it would be called. I would assume I'd probably have to not call it Oh, the Places You'll Go because... YouTube will probably be like, you don't have the rights for that, and... But how did the... Close. Burning Man, all the places you go show up then? I don't know. Maybe they got the rights. I'm not sure. I just know that Dr. Seuss is not free. It's not available. <laughs> it's not Creative Commons. So 
That's See, why I, it was another reason why it was going to be a donor's gift only uh, is just to give it to the. I'd say eighty percent of YouTube content belongs to someone else. Probably true. You can find every single track by Metallica from every single album on YouTube, and Metallica is among the sue happiest of all bands. Right. You know what I mean? Because no, people tend not to be making money from them on YouTube. But, but you know, people do get movie clips taken off all the time, or you upload an entire sketch of Saturday Night Live, and it gets taken off. So I guess I can see you trying to play it safe. Yeah, I figured I would. Uh, I mean, I don't know. But Obviously, it's, nobody it's, knows. What we did is like a cover of a song. Right, yeah. And nobody... you can cover part of your world from The Little Mermaid till the cows come home, and nobody's going to take that down true yeah nobody owns the actual audio that we made so they may not you know I, I think like Shazam or something they must have some kind of a program that just runs all this stuff through a database to see are they stealing something or not and then if they are then they'll say hey you need to take this down um, so if it doesn't pop up on that database saying yes this is pre-owned then we should be fine so yeah, I just looked for my Big Anklevich uh, account and you should be able to find it there. Or you can donate and I will send you the link and it will make it much simpler for you to find it. Okay, and yeah, so you'll have you donated, were saying, which is good too. You were saying that you were going to make a game of it where people could there's all these voices but it doesn't say who it is, who right. each one is. That was the idea was listen to the audio of it. And try and guess who every single uh, different person that comes up is. Then go to the YouTube uh, link and check your guesses versus the reality. And uh, see how well you did. Yeah, uh, some of them are not great impressions. But I figured that it would be better to do quantity than quality. You know what I mean? Like if somebody that I do really well does four stanzas of the poem, is that really better than three different people each doing like a stanza and a half? And I chose not to. I thought it would be the more different voices there are, even if somebody just has one sentence, the more fun that would be to listen to. Sure. And I think it'd be more fun definitely to try and play the game of it as well. Anyway, I, I feel like we've got an off track, but we haven't. We were just talking about forthcoming things. Yeah, all the things people you can look forward, can look to. forward to. And you did a panel about podcasting on the cheap. We were in a panel about choosing content as a uh... yeah, choosing content for your podcast that Marshall Lathan moderated, and those should be out there uh, by the time you hear this for sure. But if not, if you're hearing this first, look for those things. They're, they're more uh, content with us as the the center or, or at least participating. We in. kind of glossed over also the three story readings we did. We did mention the Catastrophe Baker one, and we did mention the Scott Sigler one. But sandwiched in between those two was a story called Overtaken that was written by Rich Outfield that we also performed on day two of New Media Expo. And I have that reading recorded, and it will be available on the, that Gets My Goat feed for you to listen to. And uh, also, you can buy that at Smashwords, right? You, Overtaken? Have you put that on Smashwords? I imagine I have, but what would I put for the image? I don't know. Yeah, I don't... A I, picture of... I bet I haven't. Okay, well, episode. I'm going to hold you to putting it on Smashwords by the time this comes out. So, there we go. I'm turning the tables on you, sir. Uh, you that's have to right. have it ready for people to buy when the... Uh... Okay, that's fine. Yeah, just go to Smashwords and the story is overtaken and it's there. Um, by, that, that, by the time this comes out, that will be available. Also, one more thing. I wrote a third sketch for us to record at the New Media Expo and that was going to be me and L. Scribe Harris. We were going to do a, a, a sexy sketch together. That was Freudian. We were going to do a sketch together and uh, <laughs> she wasn't able to attend the New Media Expo this year 
Uh, and so please, if that hasn't seen the light of day by the time this episode comes out, please bug us about it and I will get on it as fast as I can to get the two of us at least over Skype to record that. Sexy sketch? It, well, I think so. Okay, good. It better be sexy. And it would have been a blast to actually record it in the same bed room with Lauren. Was that Flo Freudian? That was too? not Freudian. That was meant to be funny. <laughs> but over the Skype is fine. Yeah, as long as you get the video link, it should be really sexy. Wait, what? No, I mean, that's why I thought it would be fun to be in a room together so that we could just take a picture and pretend that that's what it was. But anyway, uh, I believe that sketch is called Exceptional. Does okay. that sound right? I don't know. Or I do don't you, know if I've seen do it Do you yet. think it's called Sexceptional? Sexceptional? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That wouldn't be Freudian? No, I mean, it's one or the other. Cool. I think it's exceptional. Anyway... Uh, let us know I feel like we've reached the end of this but we could talk a heck of a lot more about the things that we did and that we said and the great people that we hung out and with and the places that we'll go uh, except for the waiting place because yeah. sometimes you won't <laughs> cool uh, yeah so we'll wrap this one up and maybe we'll record some more while we're still driving I think we've got a couple hours left to go so yeah we've got the worst part of our drive to go because at the very beginning or at the very end, depending on which way you're starting out, there's lots of towns and there's lots of places to stop and there's lots of pretty things to see. And then at one point you hit the desert and it's the same and there's nothing and there's no towns. There's hardly any rest stops. It's just freeway. It's empty. And it's the hardest part of the drive every time because it's nothing and it's all, it all feels like, wow, we, we've been running in place. Yeah, more or less. I just saw a sign that said how many miles we had to go, and I thought, really? We had that many still to go? I thought we were closer. Aww. So we will try and eat up some of that time by podcasting more, and it is so cool to be able to podcast and to know that people like it. Now, we don't have an audience like Scott Sigler, and we don't have an audience like Dave Thompson, who we met, who runs PodCastle, and he's a dang nice guy. But we have a, an audience of really good people and really devoted people. And uh, that's cool, man. That's something to be proud of. Yeah, it's, it's something special. And we're definitely grateful that such is the case. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll keep feeding you stuff as long as you want to eat it. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Yes, I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And your mountain is still waiting. <laughs> it's been waiting for so long, it feels like it's in the waiting place. I've been waiting. Waiting. Hey, that ain't funny, man. That gives my goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Big and Rich are a national treasure, man. Oh, we weren't recording.